Good morning, welcome to stage C. Um, before we start, I would like to remind you this is run by volunteers and we need more volunteers, uh, most notably to run the, to operate the camera and audio system, uh, but there are all kind of things that we still need people uh, to take shift for. So uh, yeah, you should really go to volunteer.emfcamp.org. Uh, but for now, I will leave you with Caroline Graham, for who is going to talk to you about open source. <laughs> Hello. Um, first thing I should say is I am not a technology person. I am not even a technology lawyer. I'm a corporate lawyer. So I'm speaking to you about um, issues that, derive, that arise from, um, from open source software um, legal ownership and licensing, uh, talking a little bit about the, the, the history and the development of, of open source and how it has um, come to the, the kind of legal status that it's at now, and looking at the future and how to put it on a more sustainable footing, because I think we have some quite um, major issues about how sustainable open source is in, a, in a, the current environment where largely it's being developed free of charge by people, um, which isn't really a model that can, that can operate long term. Um, my first encounter with open source is actually relatively recently because as I, being a corporate lawyer, I haven't had uh, the, the kind of involvement as, that an IT or an IP lawyer would have in this world. But I was contacted by a client, and I'll talk in a bit more detail about that later, just a few years ago, who uh, they, they had issues with the ownership of their open source product which they had been um, developing for many years uh, in, a, in a fairly sort of benign environment where they'd just been kind of developing it during the day as part of their everyday job. And changes in their employment environment meant that that was now uh, becoming more challenging and they wanted to protect the open source nature of the software that they had developed um, themselves over many years. And so what we did was, uh, and I'll say I'll discuss that in a little bit more detail later on, um, we established a, a more um, sustainable ownership structure to, to operate that. But um, I can't really see here. Yeah. Okay. So, just for anybody who isn't sort of familiar with the way le open source software is on, on a legal uh, basis, um, it is software which is licensed. I think it's very commonly assumed that, that because something is open source, it's just out there and available. But there is a license uh, that's axiomatic to the whole uh, the whole structure. The license um, is o is on certain terms. It is licensed free, hence the um, the, the the open nature of it. Um, and it's on terms that grant certain freedoms to the licensee. Um, what those freedoms are, though, it's incredibly difficult to see my notes, I apologise for this. Um, what those terms are, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the main licences that are available at the mo uh, that people commonly use in open source, but it is important to realise that this is, um, that, that, that when you use open source software, you, you're using it on the terms of a legal licence, a legal contract. It's increasingly an important feature of the software landscape. Um, there are uh, there are um, n nearly all companies now, large groups and companies, are using some open source in their, uh, their IT environment. That poses challenges of its own. Though, so there is, uh, a lot of people would argue that it's not being managed very strategically in those organisations because it's not being paid for and not having to go through a procurement process. Uh, it may be being seen as more of a free-for-all within IT departments and development departments. I really can't see what I'm doing here. Um, but as mentioned there are a variety of licensing structures um, that are available and we'll talk about some of those in, in a bit more detail. So it has become increasingly important in the commercial environment. A um, number of reasons for that. Obviously a lot of technological change now that um, we have more sort of software oriented architecture now that we've got more um, cloud based, internet based, oh is there a oh, fantastic. That's a help. Good. Thank you. Let's see what I've written to what I'm going to talk about. Um, and obviously the, the um, proliferation of different platforms, different hardware platforms, have made um, the open source software much more sort of relevant in the, in the technological space. The economic environment since 2008 has also meant that you know, in order to achieve a sort of competitive advantage, people are looking for lower cost um, bases for, the, for their development projects. It's also regarded as, uh, as more, you can innovate more quickly off an open source platform. Um, and there is more collaboration possible in certain areas, which is seen as, as key in uh, the economic environment now. And a changing strategic approach of, of large users, the flexibility and um, the, the shorter development times are seen as uh, critical to, to just getting projects off the ground. So there's, a, there's been a huge change in the way it's being used. Oh, that's a bit weird. Okay. 
So talk about the Free Software Foundation, founded in 1985 by Richard Stallman, and this was the, the, the beginning perhaps of the philosophy of open source. Um, he was a, an academic at MIT. He was being required to um, operate. To, anything that he developed was, was going out on commercial licenses, and he was very unhappy with the way that was, that was operating. Um, and he left MIT and set up the Free Software Foundation to oversee the GNU project, the development of, of the operating system, um, which obviously became, uh, became Linux, the kernel of Linux. Um, GNU, I love that it, it actually stands, it's a recursive acronym, it stands for GNU's not Unix. And this was an attempt, uh, intent to um, undermine uh, the Unix dominance in the market. Four freedoms were, were, def he, were those which he considered to be kind of key to what open source is. The, the right to run the software for any purpose, commercially or otherwise, um, anything you want to do. To access and freely adapt source code. To redistribute to anyone, but that's the, the interesting part of, I think, what Richard Stallman was trying to do. Um, you are able to uh, redistribute the software to anyone. You're able to adapt it um, and uh, derive your own product from it. But when you do so, and this is, uh, one of, this is the restrictive licensing model, when you do so, you are obliged to license whatever you've derived on the same terms. So you can't take the, the, the free software and essentially use it for commercial purposes. I'm just going to read a little bit from the, um, the GNU manifesto, um, the Free Software Foundation manifesto, which Richard Stallman devised, because I think that this kind of reflects the philosophical underpinning of, uh, of the whole movement. It has many things are changing underneath this now, but I think this is, this is useful. Richard Stallman said, I consider it the golden rule requires that if I like a program, I must share it with other people who like it. Software sellers want to divide the users and conquer them, making each user agree not to share with others. I refuse to break solidarity with other users in this way. I cannot, in good conscience, sign a non-disclosure agreement or a software license agreement. So that I can continue to use computers without dishonor, I have decided to put together a sufficient body of free software so that I will be able to get along without any software that is not free. Once GNU is written, everyone will be able to obtain good system software free just like air. This means much more than saving everyone the price of a Unix license. It means that much wasteful duplication of system programming effort will be avoided. This effort can go instead into advancing the state of the art. Extracting money from users of a program by restricting their use of it is destructive because the restrictions reduce the amount and the ways that the program can be used. This reduces the amount of wealth that humanity derives from the program. When there is a deliberate choice to restrict, the harmful consequences are deliberate destruction. So you can see it's very philosophical, very ideological, and a bit hippie-ish, really, um, a, bit, a bit commie. Um, and it was felt by the late 90s as um, the ideal, uh, that sort of ideological approach was um, receding. It began to be felt that that was getting in the way of the wider uh, adoption of open source. And the Open Source Initiative was set up in the late 90s with their own definition, and this essentially... Uh, on the slide are the, the ten components of the definition of, of open source software for these purposes. I think that perhaps the most interesting um, aspect of, of this is that there is uh, that the authors of derived work can retain the source code and that, that you have a freedom to distribute derived works on any terms you like. So in contrast to the GNU um, and, and the licenses on that model, you're, in, you're allowed to make money off of it in, a, in essence. And so to come to that, we now are dealing with a variety of licensing models that operate in parallel. First, the restrictive or copyleft approach. Um, this is, the, the, in the model of the GNU license, this is the, um, the idea that whatever you derive from the open source software, you must license that on the same terms so that it, it carries on being a fully open source product. Um, the GPL, the, um, the general public license, is the... Um, the, the kind of core example of this. Only a 36% market share now. In 2010, the GPL represented 64% of open source software, and now it's only 36. It's massively in decline as a, as a model of um, licensing. The permissive license um, has, is very much in the ascendant. The MIT license is now accounts for 26% of the code license in open source, and in 2010, that was only 4%. Similarly, the Apache license, 16% now, only 4% in 2010. Um, another of those are the BSD licenses, accounts for about 6%. My personal favorite, um, less than 1% of the market, but it's the do what the fuck you want to public license. I think that's a great name, and it pretty much sums up what it's all about. This is the trend 
Um, we're going towards a permissive license structure, personally, because I'm attracted to the, um, the free-for-all model. I think it's a bit of a shame that we're going that way. But if it means that, um, that the, the whole concept of open source is getting more, gaining more traction, then I guess it's a price worth paying. But I want to talk a little bit, because as I say, I'm not a technology geek, but I am a legal geek. Um, and I'm very interested in the way the GPL works. I find it a very subversive uh, model of licensing. It takes what we normally expect intellectual property law to be doing and turns it on its head and turns it to the advantage of the licensee. We think about intellectual property law as protecting the intellectual rights of the creator, often referred to as creator's rights. That's what we tend to assume it's there to do. And what the GPL does is say that the, if you use what you have received under this license, what you're entitled to use under this license, you must license it back on the same terms. It, it perpetuates an open um, type of intellectual property ownership and intellectual property licensing. When I say, though, that we, we start from the point of view of thinking of intellectual property law as a protecting of somebody's rights, of enabling them to benefit financially, usually, from their own intellectual work. In fact, whilst that is true, if you go back to the original reasons for the patent system, which was the first of, of the intellectual property models to get developed, if you go back and, and look at where that comes from, the purpose of patent law originally was not to protect people's ownership because people were doing that through secrecy. It was actually to achieve openness. It was to, you, you got the protection of the law only if you published the technology that you had developed. The idea was that it massively speeded up um, the progress of technological development by making prior inventions accessible and uh, uh, readable to the public, to people who might develop them. It, it moved it forward. And in that sense, the GPL is actually rather similar um, to that approach. It takes what, what has been achieved and says, develop it, but publish it. It just doesn't give people the commercial protection. And I'll come on to why I think that's an issue. Um, as I say, it inverts what we usually think of as the purpose of the, of the law. I also, as a legal geek, find the GPL quite exciting because it's got no governing law clause. It doesn't say it's governed by English law or New York law or Delaware law. It's just silent on the subject. So you go back to first principles. You have to go, okay, who is making the contract with whom? In what state? It's, therefore, it, it can be interpreted differently under different legal systems. So that's great in, in certain environments. In, French, in the French courts, it's a real problem because French... The French um, legal system massively prioritizes creators' rights and uh, intellectual property rights as a personal asset. And so the GPL is very difficult um, to, to operate in France. The key terms of the GPL are perpetual and irrevocable. So once you've granted the license, you can't pull it back. If you've granted, uh, if you've issued your software under the GPL, there's no kind of pulling it back in and relicensing it on a different basis. It's out there and you can't revoke it. Um, you have complete freedom as a licensee under the GPL to do whatever you like with the software, but um, as soon as you distribute or convey the software to anybody else, whether that's as itself or uh, as part of a derived product that you've created, at that point, um, you are restricted in what you can do. You are, as I've said before, obliged to um, license it on the same terms. Any breach of the license, so if you purport to distribute the software and don't do so under the GPL, revokes your rights under the license that you benefit, you're benefiting from. But that's really um, tricky as well, because what happens if you have licensed something that comprises um, the, the software that you're the beneficiary of, you on-license it to somebody else, what happens then? If your license is revoked, then you have nothing to license yourself. So the license is specific on that also. All downstream licensing um, is included in the original license. So it's a completely flat structure. There's no license and sub-license and sub-sub-license. It's just everybody benefits from the original software under the original license that it's sent out in, even if that now is part of a derived product. The Apache license is a little different. As I said, this is, more, this is a um, permissive license. You can do what you like. So once again, perpetual and irrevocable. But in this case, it permits reproduction um, and the distribution of all 
of the original software and derivative works, and you can charge for that. You can do that on any terms you like. You're not obliged to replicate the terms of the license under which you benefit. There are conditions relating to attribution, so though you can do what you like with it, you're not allowed to claim that you created it. Um, and derivative works, you can issue on any terms you like, essentially. The MIT license has four paragraphs in it. It's all on one page, and essentially it says you can do anything you like, but the author's attribution rights are protected, and that's broadly all it does. Very, very short form license. So looking at whichever model of open source you're operating, the original creator of the, of the software, um, we've, we've got to start looking, I think, now, I, as I say, I'm massively attracted philosophically to the idea that, that software is out there, it's a public good, you know, a force for good in the world, as I say on my slide. I, I'm very attracted to that idea. I'm very frustrated by part of Richard Stallman's, uh, part that I didn't read of Richard, Richard Stallman's um, FSF manifesto, where he says, surely software developers have a right to be rewarded for their work. And he goes, well, you don't have to be a software developer, which I just think is an absolutely ridiculous um, approach to, to these things. You know, everybody has the right to be rewarded for their work. We have somehow to establish, everyone has to eat, everyone has to pay the bills. We somehow have to set up a, a structure for open source software where that is achievable. And I'll come on to t talk about different ways that we might do that. Um, as I say, it, we are looking at the whole dichotomy. Is IP law, is the very existence of licensing and copyright and, and intellectual property rights in general, is this a force for protectionism, for me to protect the, the value of my intellectual work, or is it a force for progress in the world, for developing the state of the art quickly? There's an interesting question about who owns the IP in a large product that's been developed by many developers. In the nature of open source, in the nature of most... If you're employed by an organization to develop software for that organization, then anything you develop in your job becomes your employer's property, typically. It's in your employment contract, normally. On the other hand, if you're developing something as part of a, a community of developers for a, a large open source project, what happens? Who owns it? Where, where, what is the nature of the intellectual property and the ownership of it? That might not seem massively important, because obviously it's being licensed openly, it doesn't really matter, but who then enforces the license. If the person who is entitled to enforce intellectual property rights is the owner of the intellectual property rights, if you've got a product that's got 300 or 3,000 different developers, all who have different bits of ownership within it, enforcement's an absolute nightmare. They could be in all sorts of different countries. As I've said, the GPL isn't um, jurisdiction specific, so you could be trying to enforce across many countries. It, it just is its unsustainable. It's impossible. So a lot of um, open source projects include a developer's agreement where the, each developer in the developer's community assigns the intellectual property in their work to the, the, the broader whole, so that it's all in one place in, in ownership terms. So I want to talk specifically about the Linux Foundation, because I think this is one of the most sustainable models. Um, it was only founded in 2000. Obviously, Linux had been being developed for quite some time before that. And it has expanded its remit now, it, doesn't just, it isn't just focused on the development of Linux itself. It's trying to create the largest shared technology investment in history, is its mission statement. Um, it's not just uh, developing Linux. It's looking to be the main focus for any number of, of open source projects, cloud projects, Internet of Things projects. It's hosting um, various projects that have uh, been initiated by other people. So it's really trying to, to broaden out its, its reach. But within the, the, just looking at the, the development of Linux and the way that has gone, there is a developer's community. People, many of you may um, have even been involved in that, people who are developing code and contributing it back under the GPL to Linux. They also have a, a, a full-time you know, paid staff and they therefore have to fund that. And so there are, you can become, uh, companies typically can become financial members of the Linux Foundation. Um, and there are, there are there are various tiers of membership and to be a member ben buys you benefits such as the ability to kind of define what the next step um, or the next development steps should be for Linux. So the costs of it can be anything from um, half a million US dollars a year down to 5,000 US dollars a year, um, other sort of prices for the different tiers of membership. But if you think about a large organization, 
um, paying for Windows licenses instead of um, using Linux. You know, you're obviously talking about a, a massive saving. That, that these companies, these big organisations, have a huge interest in making sure that Linux is up to date and carries on working. The Linux Foundation is set up as an Oregon State non-profit mutual benefit corporation. Um, I've looked in great detail at its various constitutional uh, documentation. It has these various classes of membership. It also has affiliates who are not financial members but are corporates. Um, but who contribute in a non-financial way, typically by um, seconding or deploying some of their staff for some of their working time to, to, towards the Linux project. I'm going to talk about OpenFoam, which is a client of mine. And as I said, my, my um, initiation into the world of open source came late and came through corporate law, not through intellectual property law. And it came through this um, this outfit, OpenFoam. They are uh, uh, the people who do. They've developed um, a, a fluid flow modelling software, which is used a lot in the automotive sector, but in various other sectors too, medically indeed. Um, and it's uh, it was licensed on an open source model. It was uh, under the GPL. The company that developed it uh, was very happy for it to be open source. They were owned by an American company. Um, the key developers in the company were doing a lot of the work, although it was for open source, they were doing it in, as part of their day job, it was all very benign. And then the ownership changed, and the new owners were not happy for the developers to work on company time, and they were not happy um, for, that the, they were essentially looking for ways that they could take the software back, fork the software, and make it into a commercial product rather than an open source product. And the developers who had been involved in this from the start were very unhappy with that. So they came to me and asked if we could do something to get it onto a sustainable footing. So we looked in a lot of detail at Linux, at Geneva, Mozilla, Apache, various different models um, for, for, for owning this sort of product, and realized as we looked around that there was absolutely nothing in the UK that I could not find. I mean, I did a huge amount of dig digging on this and looked at many, many UK-owned open source software products. None of them were owned on anything approaching the, the Linux model or anything like it. Typically what we were seeing was that they were owned by a one shareholder, one share company. Licensed under the um, GPL or another open source license, but not owned in a way that would prevent or would give some kind of long term security. And that might be okay if it's one person developing a small product for themselves, you know, which they're prepared to license until they decide not to anymore. That, that might be okay. I'm not sure it is, but it might be. If what you've got is a huge developers community or a substantial developers community and people are, do are donating their time and their creativity, the idea that, that the rug could be pulled from under them, the idea that that could just be forked and turned into a commercial product by the person who owns um, the, the underlying copyright, I think is seriously problematic in a developer's community. And this is where I'm at with, when I'm talking about sustainable open source ownership, this is the thing that I, I think is, is really key. Um, so, yeah, to, um, there was nothing comparable in the UK, and as I say, various issues with the um, one shareholder, one share model. Users community also, you know, if you're using a piece of software in your business, the idea that that could just suddenly stop getting maintained, stop getting um, moved forward, is obviously a huge issue. So if we're trying to get open source more fully um, embedded in the corporate world, then th that's not, that's not going to work either. So we looked at what we could do instead in the UK. Um, looking at Linux in particular, we don't have um, a, a structure in English company law, anything like the, 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 the not-for-profit not uh, company corporation that they had in Oregon. But we decided we would create something as close as we could out of the company law vehicles that we had. We looked at community interest companies, which is a fairly new structure, essentially designed for the ownership of village halls. Uh, it didn't really, it wasn't going to do it for us. So we set up a company limited by guarantee. Um, there's nothing to stop a company limited by guarantee from distributing its profits other than its own constitutional rules, but it's typically used in not-for-profit type uh, organizations. It's also very difficult to just sell a company limited by guarantee. It's a, it, the transfer of ownership is more uh, complicated and more involved. We designed the constitutional documents extremely carefully. We had a set of articles which dealt with um, the, the, the way in which the thing would be owned and the way in which corporate governance would operate, uh, setting out the, the board, technical committee, 
Um, we also had a set of rules which could be changed by the board, which are a little bit um, sort of lighter touch, which established the qualifications that members have to uh, have to have and, and what kind of fees are going to be paid. Those sorts of things can be changed. We set it up with a model of financial membership so that any organisations that were using the software could elect to contribute financially. And as I said, they have an interest in that. They want to see the, the software maintained and developed. So it's not... On the one hand, procure de procurement departments will look at it and say, well, why are we paying for something we can have for free? But there is a, an argument that can be made and it, it can be uh, justified. We then had contributing members who are uh, people, typically individuals, who are actually developing the software and contributing uh, in their intellectual um, assets. And it was licensed under the, uh, under the GPL, with a con uh, sorry, contribution agreement, which, as I said, as I mentioned before, um, it's very typical for the contributors to, to license the, uh, to, to assign the, the benefit of their intellectual property rights, and that was done. Um, and the GPL uh, to ensure that we had the most um, restrictive license so that any developed products could not be forked. And having done this just, uh, as far as I know, it's the only one still in the UK um, that's on this sort of basis, uh, but I do think that it represents a possibility for a new paradigm, for a new way of thinking about open source so that it stops being something that people who in the development community are essentially contributing to as a kind of charity project. It starts to actually be something that, that is sustainable and potentially remunerated. So solving the economic conundrum, the how do we reward developers for the work that they're doing in, a, in an open source environment where nobody is paying, the membership model seems to offer perhaps the best approach for that, and hopefully uh, creating a, a genuinely open structure, uh, a genuinely open ownership and sustainable for, uh, for open source ownership in the future. Um, is it gone? It's gone. Um, so, that's wrong. Uh, that's me. If um, anyone wants to talk about this stuff, we've been told that we can, um, we can take questions in these talks if there's a little bit of time. I think there's a few minutes. Um, we can, I can take a few questions, but I'll be around the festival until tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm probably wait, wait, wait for the mic. Hello. Thanks for the talk. Really interesting. Um, on the membership side, about two back with the open phone model, when you mentioned members, were you talking about members in the Companies Act kind of thing for voting rights and stuff like that, or just general associate members who pay and um, don't have anything else? Um, they were... Well, the thing about um, a guarantee company is that instead of being a, sh a member... Uh, we typically think of members and shareholders as synonymous, but a guarantee company doesn't have shares, so it doesn't have shareholders. A, a, a member of a guarantee company is, uh, uh, agrees to guarantee the liabilities of the company up to a certain threshold. What we, we, we didn't um, create that kind of membership in, in the case of Open Firm. We, th they, they were members in a contractual sense, so that we had a membership agreement and they, just, uh, they have certain rights, they have certain um, committee attendance rights, um, so they can uh, dictate or um, influence the, the future direction that the software takes. So we did it that way. One last, one last question, and then I'm sorry, but you are going to need to take it out. <laughs> So, uh, what are the, you know, from the point of view of setting up a, a legal structure like this in a community that may not presently have any kind of funding, um, how, do you, how did the Open Phone Foundation overcome that? Okay, well, in the case of Open Phone, as I say, it's, it's, it's fluid flow modelling that the, um, the software does, and it does it in a variety of different um, contexts. They say medically it's used, they, they can actually model how injecting a liquid into a brain tumour will, how that liquid will flow through brain cells. But equally it models how air flows around a, 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 new, a particular shape of car. So it's very, the, the large number of, of automotive sector customers, or sort of users, and those users were invited to, to, to join and to become members. And by, because their membership entitles them to influence the direction that the software development takes. Um, and because the alternative is to buy a commercial license in for, uh, for another product, which would be considerably more expensive, 
a number of their users were willing to, to participate in that way. But of course you do, you know, Linux is, is a similar model. People join, co corporations join uh, in order to influence the direction and in order to know that um, the, the product will continue to be developed um, and maintained and sustained. But you do have to have a sufficient user base, I think, to persuade anybody that, that this is something that is worth investing in. So we are out of time, but uh, yeah, if you have more questions, please go come find the speaker uh, after. Um, thank you. Thank you.